and welcome to another inspiring episode of Visionaries Lounge. It is so good to have you with us this evening. Just as good as hearing a song or a poem or a story from our guest this evening, Dr. Nose Namshope. She is an author, she's an activist, she's an actress, she's a storyteller, she is a director, a playwright, as well as a poet. And I think as the saying goes, Ndi Malandoni na so many things. <laughs> it's such a pleasure to have you with us this evening. Thank you. Did you know growing up that your voice would be such an asset to the country, transporting stories from days of old until now? <laughs> no, I did not. You mentioned the voice. I did not like my voice. I really, really prayed hard for God to send an angel to change the voice because I wanted a soprano. Yeah, and it's a double bass. A double bass. It's but a double bass. Hello. <laughs> and um, I'm so glad that uh, God didn't change my voice because it has become my identity. Even when I go to areas where people are not sure it's me, they come and they greet me. Saubon, Kunjan, we are Phil. Meeting your Phil. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah we'll the voice. <laughs> <laughs> so, indeed, I didn't oh. know that. But uh, maybe I needed to go through the difficult times mm. in my formative years in order to be polished. How was I going to shine if I was never polished? Mm. Yes. But refining is a process that takes place when you go through the fire. The fire. Let's talk about those formative years. Mm. Where did you grow up? The, the, the first half of my life, I was in, in, in Guazulu Natal with my family, Baba, Oma, grandparents. And um, the, 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 that was a beautiful time. It was a beautiful beginning. I was this princess person. And told stories and my life was lovely. I didn't know my mother very well because I lived in, in Durban and my father wa was there, my sisters, I look like them, I belong. I'm at home, I mean, I was in years. I belong, young is. So the next thing I know, Guno Mama Futu Mama Dala treated me like her own daughter. And then my life turned. And when I went to live in the Eastern Cape in my mother's village, change was just unbelievable. It was like a day, night. But um, in spite of my not wanting to be there, I needed to be there. At first, I didn't even see the beauty in the mountains. Why did you in have Mount to move? Because my biological mother, I had two mothers. Mm -hmm. My biological mother was from Mount Frey, Kwapaza. Mm -hmm. And so she came to fetch me. Mm -hmm. And when people read my, my autobiographical play, Have You Seen Zandile? That's actually what happened to me. And um, loving languages happened at that time because I had to learn to speak it closer. And I decided to speak it well. I wanted to really, really do well, and I couldn't do many things. I couldn't balance a bucket of water on my head. I couldn't put cow dung on the floor and all of the things children of my age group could do. So I decided I'd hold on to the book. Yeah. And so I'm so glad. I don't know where that foresight came from, but God must have sent um, a voice, you know, that said, listen, that's where you've got strength. Mm -hmm. And so I, f I focused on excelling in the classroom and enjoying languages. And so from, le from Mrs. Zulu to Mrs. Tosa to English, and then we did Latin at, at high school and all of those things. So I, I got to learn to speak other languages, even as an adult living in Johannesburg, learned to speak Sisu too. And then I, I married a German. I had to learn to speak his German. And uh, my, my daughter is far better than me, of course. No crazy <laughs> speaks fluent German. Talk to me about the move to Johannesburg. When did that come about? I moved uh, to Johannesburg when I finished my matric in 1978. And I came here mostly to see specialists. I used to have kidney problems and what. At General Hospital in Hillbro, I used to be a regular there. And uh, then I stayed on. I did uh, other things. Um, and then I couldn't get a bursary to, 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 to go to university. Then I, I did a course there. I did another one. I did a cadet course. I thought I was going to be a journalist. Mm. I was convinced, OK, I found my career. But you were not far off. No, not far off it at wasn't all. It too far <laughs> off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I got um, invited to read news for Press Trust, the, 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 the radio um, company that I did. I used to read news for BBC Africa Service. Mm. Uh, I used to read news for Radio Netherlands. And I used to do ZBC. So I was news reading. And again, I had to, this woman who, who hired me said, I love your voice. I think you can read the news. That very thing that you loathed that as a child hello. was working in your favor once correct, again. Correct, correct. Okay. And to learn to breathe, to learn to pronounce your words properly, because people on radio cannot rewind and say, we didn't hear what she said, or swallowing your words when you are pronouncing or explaining what happened at a certain place. There was a protest. And then from there, learning to do voiceover. Mm -hmm. yeah? So I had to do so much with my voice. Mm -hmm. 
and, and, and then in theater as well, it was important to project. But now, Nogwaja had other plans. He wanted to go up there and trick the lion into being stuck up there so that he would get all the meat. That's what he was after. So it wasn't quite journalism that you followed. How did you venture on into something else? I started um, getting involved with uh, Kaoleza. I was living in Alexander Township at the moment, and I, I became part of a poetry group in Alex called Kaoleza. And um, being part of college, I meant that uh, you moved uh, towards political stuff. Mm. And then I joined the Women's Federation and um, later on, no UDF and all of those things. But um, I was performing poetry at political gatherings. I was marching in the streets and what. And performing that poetry in political gatherings, Maisha Maponya, a playwright and director from Soweto, saw me on stage and he asked me if I could be in his play. And I agreed. At the time, I was writing for Learn and Teach magazine. I was a full-time journalist for Learn and Teach. Yeah. So I would knock off at 5 o'clock. He would pick me up, and off we went to DOCC in Soweto and rehearse until 10 o'clock, drive me back all the way back to Alexander Township. Huh? And so I went on stage. I performed Umongi Gazi. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I thought it was just a sketch in the meantime. I thought it was no meantime, baby. I was moving to another place. Uh -huh because the next thing you know, I'm, my face is in the newspapers, people are talking, I'm thinking, I'm the journalist over yes, here. Yes, I'm not the story. You know? I'm usually telling the story. Why I, am I the I'm supposed to be interviewing people, yes. not being interviewed. Wow. In my thinking, at least, I think storytelling is the mother of all the other art forms in any culture. You can go to any part of the world. The beginning, people learned to speak, and uh, when they learned to speak, languages were born out of language, storytelling happened. When stories came, there was fun in the world. Would you then say that storytelling chose you, as opposed to you choosing it? That's a fact. Storytelling chose me. I, I think storytelling became a calling when I was in America, directing, have you seen Zandile, my autobiographical play in Chicago. And uh, people thought that um, she's from Africa, she should know stories. And so people started asking me to go and perform storytelling at Dusabo Museum, in libraries, and I did it because my grandmother had told me lots of stories as a child. And uh, when I came back to South Africa, I thought this is madness. Telling stories in America, what about South Africa? Yes. So in 1989, I was the resident director at the Market Theatre, and I asked Manny Manim, the managing director at the market, if I could do a weekend of storytelling. Mm. And he said, yes, I love storytelling. I couldn't believe it that he loved storytelling. And um, Barney Simon as well, my mentor at the Market Theatre, was so excited about it. So we did a weekend of storytelling, and I've never looked back. <sighs> Imagine a world without stories or dreams. I'm quoting you directly now from <laughs> one of your books, and we will venture into that a little bit later. Do stay with us. I call on you, sky, you, sun, and the moon, you, earth, and the sea. Give me wisdom I need. Welcome back, and thank you so much for joining us. Our guest this evening is one of the greatest custodians of South Africa's oral history and the keeper of all things sacred here in this land we call home. Mamkrina? Talk to me then about this niche that you had found, the art of storytelling, and how it just grew and blossomed into what we see today. Going into full-time storytelling, it was like um, being able to straighten up and fly right. I always said to Barney Simon, I'm flying with crooked wings. I was happy, I was successful, I was collecting awards all over the world, in the theatre world, but there was something I needed. I couldn't put a finger on it. I kept saying I'm flying with crooked wings. And then when I went into full-time storytelling, it was really like I'm opening my wings, I'm taking into the skies, and uh, I've reinvented this thing called joy and belonging. So I love telling stories, especially because I feel like a cultural ambassador. The celebration of that year was the sweetest in living memory. So, so see, we are how did you feel at the peak of all this? And, and, and I should perhaps rephrase that because yes. you're still at the peak and you're still venturing on other things and we'll yes. talk about uh, your yes. quests later. Yes. But, but at, at the height of all this, what was your feeling inside? I think, um, let's talk about 1988. 
I felt like I was um, on fast forward and I couldn't find the brakes. And um, I was accepting jobs there, accepting that one and buy the airplane ticket, I'm on my way. And I'm off to that, I'm off to that country and I'm doing this. It was just wonderful, moving from this, uh, the, the, this play and doing another one. And then, and then um, directing in Knoxville, Tennessee, and off I go to Canada, and off I go to Germany, and off, all over the place. And I have been so lucky. And also, hard work is my middle name. I hear we go overseas. We hear we run aeroplane. Oh, I'm glad to find the old, um, my name is good for my son. <laughs> What are the struggles that you've had to face in all of this? Because otherwise, it, it sounds perfect. No, it's not perfect. I, 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 I'm, very, I'm a very decisive uh, shopper. If I walk into a shop and I see a nice glass, I want to eat this one. Go if I can afford it, yeah. ask to get take away. Then. <laughs> you take away, then ask to get. I'm a decisive shopper. And the same thing, when I make up my mind that I'm going to do something, I do it. But sometimes, I can be impulsive, of course, yeah. When you are so impulsive, sometimes you agree to do something. And then you look at the way this thing is happening and the type of people you are working with. What am I going to do? It's just not the right place and the energy is wrong and so what? So vumi. So vumi. Mm. I'm a woman of my word. You see, I've agreed. I can't not do it. So I sit in the dressing room. I collect my thoughts. And um, I'm, I'm traveling with the almighty God. And I say, Ngulungul, it's just you and me. It's just you and me. We're going to do this thing no matter what. And so the people that I might be working with at the time are just rubbing me all the wrong way. They must be just giving me havoc. I want to just break down and cry or get my bag and run away. Mm -hmm. But I think, no, no, no. Quita, Trina, doesn't rhyme, does it? Doesn't rhyme. So I hit the stage. I do what I was born to do. And I know the audience has got nothing to do with the chaos the backstage. Yeah. yeah, the audience has got nothing. And I give my best. That ugly way of doing things, it came back to Nokwacha and he remembered who he really is. One who annoys others, one who hurts others, one who humiliates others. And he started shouting at the top of his voice. Apela Maspenti, hoo Apela Maspenti, hoo Apela Maspenti, hoo Apela Maspenti, hoo I also like to say, that God is a magician. Yeah. Throughout the, 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 the show, as you were doing your hair, it's just been creeping in, creeping in, creeping in. What do you mean by that? Sometimes um, you want to do a big event. Sometimes uh, there's something that you want to do and it's just not coming together. And there's that thing called upajet. Hey, upajet. Hey, upajet. Diabolical thing. Upajet, like upajet. Um, give me a big punch. <laughs> and nothing is coming together. Nothing is coming together. And then I remember, Let's rewind. Let's look for the page where God ever let me down. I can't find the page um, last year or the year before or 10 years or 20 years before. He never let me down. And I look at myself in the mirror. I say, God is a magician. This thing is going to happen. And it's true. Indeed, it does happen. Even giving birth to my child at the age of 38, I had my daughter at the age of 38. I had my daughter at the doctors told you it wouldn't be so. Yes, the doctors told me it wouldn't be so. And um, I had to really, really think hard. What's going to happen here? But I thought, am I alone in this? Huh? I was brought up in the house of song and prayer. And then the morning star arrived. No more crazy. Beautiful. My husband and I were staring at her for hours after she had been born. And the crazy thing is that my friend uh, Janet Susman was in the country. She was uh, directing uh, the, uh, the, the, the Good Woman of Shackville. We were going to do it together. I was going to play the lead role until uh, <laughs> the young person um, <laughs> says, I'm, I'm arriving. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we worked on, on the script and all of those things. And then on the day Noma Kwezi was born, she's going to do an interview on Morning Live. She phones me, when is the child coming? When is the child of yours arriving? Yeah. I said, well, she was born at 11 minutes past four yesterday, yeah. 11th of July. And um, she's lying here next to me. Oh, wonderful. What's her name? Noma Kwezi. Brilliant. I must go. I must go. I've got an interview. She goes. She gets on TV. She tells the whole of South Africa that there's South somebody Africa. called Noma Kwezi who was born 11 minutes past four. 
for on the 11th of July. And people are phoning nonstop. Congratulations, welcome to the world. No more crazy. <laughs> Oh, uh, because you are the herald usually, but you were unable to tell that story, so somebody had to tell it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be your life. You <laughs> no, know, you're the storyteller. Be. Someone had to tell oh, your story. Amazing, amazing. Another thing that um, happens about young people. Two stories. I was uh, performing in Seattle. A young boy was standing there waiting for people to hug me and to ask for autographs and whatever. And they repeat this word, awesome, you're awesome, until I'm thinking, is this dictionary so limited in America? Is everything oh, awesome? Hello. <laughs> anyway, awesome, awesome, okay, fine, I'm awesome, I'm awesome, until it loses the taste. Yeah. And then it's quiet and he comes over, because he's been waiting patiently. And he says, um, I want to ask you a question. Do you know where the heart of a person is in their hand? heart of a person I don't think I know where the heart of a person is he says well I know triumphantly you should have seen yeah, yeah. how chuffed he was with himself I said please tell me he said show me your hand mm -hmm. so he took my hand and he said you see where the thumb and the forefinger meet mm -hmm. right here is the heart of a person and when they shake hands they want their hearts the to hearts touch need. you see and I thought, well, young man, you've taught me something new. Now that was awesome. You yeah, know what I'm that saying? was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that. And many oh. times when people make a deal or they agree on something, they say, let's shake on it. Oh. And we shake hands. Hearts Our hearts must touch or touch my heart. I just love that. I wish I could shake your hand so our hearts could touch and I can give you my word that I'll be back in just a moment. Stay with us. <laughs> Once again, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us. We have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. We have a little bit more time left, but I cannot let you go without asking you about how you ventured into song now. So you've done the acting, you've done the storytelling, etc. You have a CD in front of you where you're singing and you almost brought me to tears earlier. Talk about that. I think um, when I became a storyteller, full-time storyteller, I also found that there was another part of me that wanted uh, to sing. And um, I think maybe my, the type of voice I've got, I thought I can't mess up other people's songs. Eh? Let me just write my own songs. Mm -hmm. And um, this is the third CD I'm releasing with Budpegi Koza. Every CD I've written all the music on it. One of the big things about me People say, oh, you, 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 you don't change and you're always so happy. You, you don't you have difficult problems or whatever. I say to them, no matter how hard times can be, I celebrate life. And my multivitamin is called gratitude. Wow. That's my multivitamin, gratitude. I love it. I could use a double dose of that you sometimes. Know, Tell yes. me about hope, so, perhaps, as a, mm -hmm. as, a, as a omega. Yeah, well, that is your multivitamin. Yeah, hey, omega yeah, three, you hope, omega yeah. Three. <laughs> yeah, I, I, hope, I always have hope. I'm a very positive person. And um, the Hope song, I wrote it when problems found my address and they parked on the veranda. And I thought, I'm a strong woman. I'm a strong woman. And now something terrible well. happens. No, 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 I'm a strong woman. I'm going, I'm going. And then something else, oh, no, 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 I'm a strong woman. I'm not going to break. I mean, I'm not a breaking person. And then one morning, oh, oh, the floodgates opened. I couldn't stop crying. And what? And it just um, at some point, you, you, can't, you, you can't be strong anymore. Where were you when this happened? I was at Vert's Theatre, mm. I was going to go on stage in half an hour, and it was sold out, and we couldn't postpone the show, and uh, the producer came and said, what can I do, what can I do, what happened, and can I give you a hug? Uncontrollably. And when somebody hugs you and tries to be nice to you, when you're upset, you cry even more. Yo, what is she crying for exactly? I can't put it into words, because there are so many things, everything, everything piling up together. Mm. And uh, I said, please, can we just wait a little bit? I can't go on stage. He said, fine, I'll tell the audience we've got a technical problem. <laughs> technical tears. Very, very technical. <laughs> and so he left, and I sat alone in the dressing room, and I started humming. I don't know where that melody came from. And then from humming, the, the words came, and then I started singing. When he came back to check on me, I was singing at the top of my voice, this hope song. And so 
That was how the song was born. I said, tell the audience we're ready to start. I washed my face, I got ready, and I hit the stage and I performed like nothing ever went wrong. I, I, I love then to, to, to have this positivity. Even the woman who designed the cover of the CD, Michelle Governor, she made this pro bono. She made the mosaic, it's big. And then when the memory house opens, it's gonna be hung up on the wall. Talk to me about the you memory know. house. The memory house is an oral history museum I've been dreaming about for 20 years. Wow. And eventually now we've got a space uh, at Pixley House in the middle of uh, the city of Durban. So that's where the memory house will be, an audiovisual space where people will be listening to stories, watching DVDs, or also having audio um, booths where people can go in and listen. Somebody said, you mean there'll be a story jukebox? Yes, uh, yes. yes a story <laughs> jukebox. But it's our own oral history for you. ordinary South Africans. On a personal level, how yeah. does it feel to see that dream come true? I feel like um, time for birth has come. 20 years later, this dream is being born. How else are you giving back? I run a literacy campaign as well called Nozingwadi, Mother of Books. Mm. We have been doing it since 2001. We've traveled all over South Africa. We visit schools that don't have libraries, sometimes not even library boxes. We donate books to those children. And Nozingwadi was my great-grandmother. She couldn't read or write. So I feel like uh, Nozingwadi is operating from beyond the grave, and I'm just the ambassador who's carrying that. Every time when we finish a show uh, at all those schools, when we do poetry, storytelling, and what, and reading books and donating, I say, this is a gift from Nozingwadi to you. I love education with all my heart. What's the next frontier? What else do you want to achieve? I've got to finish my first novel. I've never written a novel before. And um, also, I will be doing African Mother Christmas, the, the musical. We've done it before, but now we're going to do it really bigger. And we're going to work with script doctors to just tighten the bolts. Mm -hmm. But I want to run the memory house for as long as I shall live. It's a passion project. Yebo, yebo. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I've thoroughly enjoyed talking you to so you. Much. And uh, you speak about words and loving words, mm, and we're going to wait mm. to hear some words of wisdom from you yeah, in just a moment. Thank yeah, you so boy. much for joining us. Cecilia Bong, I have yourself a fantastic evening. I hope you're just as inspired as I am. Bye-bye. I'm so lucky and blessed by the privilege of being a mother and I'm grateful for the joy that you bring into my life. Like I say to many, many young people in South Africa, I say, go for your dreams, work as hard as you can, and never forget that the Almighty is there with you. Nobody can ever love you and give you power more than umveli ngangi, unkulu unkulu, usomandla. To all young people of my country, work hard, be strong, and be respectful human beings. Ngiabonga, thank you, and good night.